Hello, everyone, and welcome to Attitude Magazine's ADHD Experts broadcast. We hope everyone is staying safe and staying well. We are pleased to have Dr. Ellen Littman here to talk about how and why ADHD is different for women. Before we get started, let me note a couple of housekeeping items. Those of you tuned into the live webinar may download the slides now by clicking on the event resources section of your webinar screen. And if you're interested in the certificate of attendance option, look for instructions in the email you'll receive around an hour after the live broadcast. For those of you listening in replay or podcast mode, you can visit attitudemag.com and search podcast 337 to access the slides, the webinar replay, and the certificate of attendance option. Now for today's topic, women in ADHD. ADHD exacts a greater psychological toll on women than it does on men, with more troubling long-term outcomes demonstrated in medical research. The psychological distress can gradually erode women's self-worth and quality of life. The good news is that experts today are creating holistic treatment plans tailored to women's needs. Rather than being silenced by shame, women are learning to trust their own voices. Dr. Ellen Littman will give us the perspective to better understand the challenges and how to manage them. Dr. Littman is a clinical psychologist licensed in New York State, educated at Brown and Yale Universities, the Clinical Psychology Doctoral Program of Long Island University, and the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. She has been involved in the field of attentional work disorders for more than 30 years. In her private practice in Mount Kisco, New York, Dr. Lippman focuses on high IQ adult and adolescent ADHD populations. She is co-author of the book, Understanding Girls with ADHD, now in its updated second edition and translated into several languages. You can ask questions of Dr. Lippman, excuse me, during her presentation, and she will answer as many as she can after she finishes. So with all that being said, I'll now turn it over to Dr. Lippman. Thanks so much for being here today. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm so glad you're here and that you're interested. With so much information available on ADHD online, we may have a false sense that we know more about the experience of women than we really do. And I emphasize that we are constantly learning more and that there are plenty of controversies. The majority of studies on ADHD have used boys as subjects. Uh, if both genders were included, the ratio is usually heavily weighted towards boys. There is far less research on adults with ADHD and fewer involving women and even fewer comparing women with uh, ADHD to women without ADHD. So in other words, the study of women with ADHD is still in its infancy. What we do know is that as long as women with ADHD continue to be overlooked, they won't be subjects in studies. And as long as they're understudied, they're going to remain misunderstood and underserved. Until recently, the inner lives have been virtually unknown to us, and far too many still suffer in silence. So let's talk about why the struggles of these women have been invisible to so many for so long, and how we can help to illuminate the realities. Okay, if you join me for a quick stroll down memory lane, um, I want to illustrate why adult women, especially without hyperactivity, could not possibly have been diagnosed until now. ADHD is a product of its history. As many of you know, a century ago, disruptive boys were referred to clinics and the earliest studies were based on the behaviors of those young, white, hyperactive boys. So only the rarest girls whose behavior mimicked hyperactive boys could be diagnosed. And so the assertion was that 
Uh, ADHD was a do disorder that only affected boys. And that theory persisted into the century. So as those boys reached puberty, their hyperactivity began to wane. And so the assumption was that this was a predominantly male disorder, limited to childhood, and diagnosis required the presence of hyperactive symptoms by age seven. This is not a good setup for women. Until 2013, ADHD was classified as a disruptive disorder of childhood based on the hallmark of hyperactivity. The diagnostic criteria and assessment scales focused on the observable behaviors of disruptive males. So once it was established in 1980 that ADHD could be diagnosed without hyperactivity, the floodgates could be opened for girls to be diagnosed. And gradually it became clear that inattentive symptoms persisted longer than hyperactive symptoms and that many cases of ADHD uh, did not uh, resolve at puberty and instead persisted into adulthood. And there we have women. Uh, so now um, we're looking at how we can improve our diagnostic accuracy because we want to talk about why women have been invisible. Uh, so we need to shift our conceptualization from a behavior model to an impairment model. So we have to understand the complex functional impairments that compromise women's quality of life. And to date, this may be the most gender inclusive way of understanding ADHD's impact because women's experiences are not easily articulated or observed or categorized and many clinicians don't know what questions to ask. So, so here's, here's the uh, head scratching dilemma. Uh, okay, uh, the DSM-5, which is published by the American Psychiatric Association and used only in the United States, um, is the diagnostical, a diagnostic manual that was updated in 2013 and it now includes two sentences on gender differences. Uh, studies based on the DSM-5 criteria have concluded that there are no significant differences in terms of uh, symptoms of ADD, severity, uh, prevalence, number of symptoms, number of comorbid disorders, academic achievement, efficacy and tolerability of meds. Okay. So in light of that finding, um, why are the outcomes so different? And we're gonna try to look at the research that explains the very different experience of women uh, with ADHD. Okay, so um, uh, girls growing into women have a unique developmental trajectory. And it's true, ADHD doesn't differ by gender. It's the genders that differ from each other. They're biologically and neurologically different and are socialized according to different societal rules. It's only in the last 20 years that these concepts uh, will have come together uh, to characterize a really different picture of ADHD. Uh, uh, women have a greater likelihood of inattentive symptoms and uh, less hyperactive and impulsive symptoms. And they're more likely to internalize uh, mood and anxiety symptoms, shame, loneliness, uh, frustration. Um, and so that creates a much more subtle picture. Um, the people who are familiar with the traditional hyperactive uh, symptoms would be not seeing something recognizable. So we'll talk about why gender roles and compensating are so central to women's lives and discuss hormones in some depth, depth because that research is really new and really interesting and really important. 
Okay. So these are risks that uh, we find are, exist much more for women with ADHD um, and um, whether compared to men with ADHD or compared to uh, women without ADHD. So more emotional um, reactivity. Uh, and to a clinician of someone who uh, might be very anxious, might have a mood disorder, uh, because um, it is not uh, yet classically a symptom of ADHD, but um, it is a very common symptom nonetheless and uh, experienced by most women. Uh, women also report lower self-esteem as well as more anxiety and depression and more psychological distress. And it's true that women uh, with ADHD experience more anxiety and depression than men with ADHD. But the reality is that women without ADHD experience more anxiety and depression than men without ADHD. So hopefully the theme is gonna become clear that uh, the issue is not about ADHD per se, but it's about uh, the differences in women and uh, how uh, that makes their symptoms play out very differently. Uh, women also have been on more medications for depression and anxiety before they're diagnosed with ADHD. Um, they have uh, more long-term unemployment, more poor job functioning, um, and more of uh, uh, histories that have physical abuse, sexual abuse, and neglect, um, which of course increase the risk of anxiety and depression. So these are some of the diagnostic challenges that we're trying to understand why don't more girls and women uh, get diagnosed and uh, ideally, the you know, earlier the better. So the first issue is about presentation. Um, I hear constant reports, uh, sadly, that women have been told, no, you couldn't have ADHD because you're a woman. Uh, you couldn't because you're so smart, uh, because you did fine in school, because you're a successful professional. Uh, and none of these things preclude um, someone having ADHD, but clearly that is not a present presentation that clinicians are uh, familiar with. Uh, there are different symptoms, uh, internalizing symptoms and more inattentive symptoms. It's a very a subtle presentation and uh, generally not at all disruptive. There are also uh, comorbidities that further complicate the picture. And um, there's the impact of hormones that we're gonna talk a lot about, but according to where in, uh, in the cycle a woman is when she's meeting a clinician, she's gonna look very different a week before her period than a week after her period. And if you don't know um, anything about that cycle, you won't know, you won't have the context uh, for what you're seeing. Another, uh, another thing that is uh, really unique to women is how motivated they are to camouflage their symptoms. And, uh, and hiding is a big part of their presentation. Uh, so it, they are in some ways intentionally uh, trying to uh, not to be seen. Um, uh, and so it's a mixed bag. If they succeed, um, they don't get the help they need. And the symptoms that are observable are often anxiety related or mood related. And it is easy to see how if you're working from observable, observable behaviors only, there could be a misdiagnosis. And there often is. Yeah. 
The other aspect of the diagnostic challenges is about gender bias. Gender bias is not intentional, but it is insidious and pervasive, and it influences how we label what we see, and is certainly contributed to the limited and delayed diagnoses of females. Women's non-traditional presentation may appear less impaired, and inattentive symptoms rarely arouse concern. Uh, so uh, many were never referred um, as girls or teens by teachers or parents um, or by primary care providers. Uh, rating scales are still skewed towards male behavior symptoms um, based, again, on that history. And uh, internalized symptoms are unaddressed and many instruments are not normed for women's uh, values. So we are still perpetuating the idea that it is much easier to be diagnosed if you look similar to hyperactive males. Women regularly feel that their concerns are not perceived as credible. Uh, and there, when I got involved in this field, um, I went to a conference and the keynote speaker uh, referred to girls as ADD wannabes. And uh, this is not exactly where we are now because that was the early 90s, but it's still a case where uh, women have sub threshold um, number of criteria because those criteria are still very male-based based behaviors. Uh, the, and uh, girls would not be showing their symptoms until uh, puberty, and we'll talk about why in a minute. Um, so a cutoff at age seven was going to mean that we would still not be getting too many girls picked up. So inattentive symptoms remain constant over the lifespan while hyperactivity wanes. And so it is why we have to start looking at a lifespan impairment model. And uh, they need to be interviewed about the internalizing issues because they're not tapped by uh, rating scales. And they also need to ha have trauma-informed questions, uh, because these histories have a huge impact on uh, their ADHD symptoms. And unfortunately, the end result of being uh, invisible is that they are less likely to be medicated, uh, um, significantly less likely than men. Okay, so we're going to talk about hormones. So this is a, a really quick uh, uh, hormones one-on-one, -on -one, this first slide, which is that um, uh, not everyone is aware that the reproductive hormones, uh, ovarian hormones, um, are also, uh, the brain is a target organ for them as well as a reproductive system. In, and in fact, uh, those hormones interact with almost every system in the body and their essential components in physical, social, and emotional health for all women. And estrogen projects, protects the brain by enhancing neurotransmitter activity, which uh, then impacts executive functions, attention, verbal memory, sleep, concentration, motivation, in so many cognitive and uh, emotional factors. And I think not everyone is aware of how widespread the impact of estrogen can be. Uh, and that baseline estrogen levels change dramatically across the lifespan, uh, starting from uh, you know, early puberty and, uh, you know, on on in which there's a tremendous amount of fluctuation in adolescence. Uh, levels are very high during pregnancy. They drop precipitously in the postpartum period. And then um, 
uh, perimenopause comes along uh, faster than you think, around age maybe 38. Um, and, and then gradually estrogen is decreasing until it's you know out of your system uh, by menopause. And since we're living longer, uh, most women spend more than a third of their lives in menopause. So um, we have to talk about what it's like to live without estrogen in your system when it has such a central role in ADHD. Okay, so this is um, their, the impact of estrogen on ADHD. And the first thing to know is that symptoms vary with hormone fluctuations which means that they, they can vary almost day to day because hormones fluctuate. I mean, it is not, you know, just they go up and they go down. It is, it, they are, there are daily mini fluctuations. Um, and some people, especially um, the more impulsive women are very sensitive even to those micro fluctuations. And uh, estrogen, I think I mentioned before that, that we don't really start seeing the blossoming of symptoms in girls, uh, unless they're extremely hyperactive, until estrogen starts being present in their systems, which happens around puberty. And so, um, you know, by the time you see a 14 or 15 year old girl, uh, they're experiencing a lot of emotional volatility and uh, anxiety and uh, this is a primary time where they may be misdiagnosed and uh, mismedicated. And let's see. Uh, so the other major piece is that ADHD symptoms increase as estrogen decreases. So estrogen decreases after ovulation, the middle of the cycle, um, and then um, gets lower and lower as you approach your period. And then the combination of low estrogen and high progesterone uh, exacerbates symptoms tremendously. And that is actually uh, just shortly after ovulation. Uh, and as I said, the impulsive women are sensitive to each of these changes as well of, of uh, the change from uh, high progesterone to low progesterone. Uh, so the point is that uh, these estrogen and progesterone affect your symptoms of ADHD. ADHD is thought of as something that has stable symptoms across time. And, and the fact is that that's not the experience uh, of women and their bodies. Uh, and that's a big deal. So, so what are some of the things that um, you know we need to think about when we're considering hormones in treatment? Uh, so, one thing is that uh, the stimulants may be less effective in the second half of the menstrual cycle, and there are people who actually will um, you know, make a small increase in the stimulant level during you know, that last 10 days of the cycle. Uh, but it's important to be aware. Uh, lots of people say, I don't understand it. My meds are just not working today. Well, in fact, they might not be working that day because of the change in hormone levels. Um, many women are uh, prescribed SSRIs um, for anxiety and depression that are some of those internalized symptoms we talked about. But it's just important to know that they can be a trade-off. Um, they certainly do help with anxiety and depression, but one of the ways that they do that is by um, uh, making the thinking less rigid, which has a side effect of disinhibiting. And um, many people with ADHD are, um, are just struggling to inhibit their responses. So it's important to know that there can be this um, undermining uh, side effect where uh, it may be harder to inhibit uh, your reactions, but you may feel uh, less anxious and less depressed. Oral contraceptives. Um, 
are really, they really work for stabilizing hormone levels. Uh, and that can regulate a really unpredictable cycle and just keep estrogen levels under the bell curve. Um, and it also can improve depression and acne. Uh, and so there are many people uh, using these pills for that purpose. Um, and um, hormone replacement therapy, HRT, increases estrogen and progesterone um, in uh, postmenopausal women, and it, it greatly improves ADHD symptoms and also uh, prevents menopausal bone loss as a perk. So the point is that uh, there are so many ways that there are interactions between the hormones and the way ADHD symptoms are uh, experienced uh, by women that it really needs to be taken into account when you're uh, choosing a medication regimen, if that's what you intend to do. And so um, the implications of these hormone studies, and I, I do want to say that there aren't that many studies. Um, and this is all pretty new and cutting edge. Um, and you may know more about it than uh, some clinicians at the end of this talk. Um, that daily symptoms are affected by hormone fluctuations. So whereas it has been thought that ADHD is in the state versus trait, things that um, they stay stable across time, or state things that change um, across time, it was thought that, that it was a trait that it stayed pretty stable. Um, but the reality is it stays pretty stable for males and it really does not, is not stable for women. Women, it is, um, it, it's a changing state. And uh, that is a very different way of thinking than we have uh, even considered before. So since we're understanding how different women's experience can be, you can understand that comparing women's um, findings on, on any given study to men does not necessarily make that much sense. Uh, it's, it's, it, it's not that men are the precedent, um, which is how it's been based on the historical gender bias. Um, it's just apples and oranges, and we have to compare women with ADHD to women without ADHD uh, in, in order to get a sense of uh, how their experiences vary. And so clinicians need to be able to ask questions about hormones. Where are you in your cycle? Uh, are you in menopause? Uh, you know, have, if you were pregnant, how long ago were you pregnant? Things that would... Uh, illuminate the uh, hormonal cycle issues. And just that future studies need to include hormonal data or we're still gonna be missing a lot of information um, about whether um, that, you know, how can we understand that woman a week before her period who may be crying and uh, overly sensitive and maybe even a little paranoid and hopeless and then a week after a period being uh, confident and together and uh, organized. Um, and uh, there has to be a way of understanding how those two views uh, coexist, not just in one or two women, but in all women, essentially. So the next huge um, uh, reason for a very different presentation of women is about gender role expectations. Women who are able to conform to expectations do. Our society's gender rules require deference, empathy, cooperation, eff efficiency, organization, and the sacrifices necessary to always put others' needs first. And then if you can also go to yoga, it's great. Uh, that's a lot of expectations. And the women who thrive with that juggling act are unicorns 
because that role demands a perfect choreography of the executive functions. So women with ADHD are definitely not wired for the unrealistic demands of such an overwhelming job. And yet somehow they're determined to manage self, family, and home. Craving social acceptance, they camouflage their problems from family and friends while they fear being discovered as an imposter. They doubt their competence and compare themselves harshly to their peers. Shame and stigma makes them unwilling to share what they perceive as failures or to ask for help. So to understand women with ADHD, cl clinicians cannot underestimate the extent to which women measure their self-worth by their success in conforming to gender expectations. Another area that is much more troubling for women than for men is um, the area of socialization. Uh, women with ADHD are often overwhelmed with the demands of relationships. They tend to have fewer meaningful relationships and rarely initiate friendships and have trouble maintaining them. Uh, there's a lot of uh, less stimulating maintenance that's involved in checking in with friends. Um, and it's difficult for them to connect in a timely way and friends easily fall off their overcrowded radar screens. Rejection sensitivity, um, which is a, a phrase that has been a, a, around lately, um, describes an intense emotional response to real or perceived rejection. And many women with ADHD feel judged, misunderstood, and expect criticism. So this is sort of an, an, an offshoot of emotional dysregulation. And, uh, it, but it's one that most women, I think, um, experience and find to be one of the most undermining um, aspects of their impairment because they have, um, you know, large overreactions uh, or reactions that m people may perceive as overreactions, uh, but it doesn't seem to be in their control. Females discover very early that sexuality is a shortcut to social acceptance. It's common to find a history of early initiation of sexual activity, early intercourse, more sexual partners, more casual sex, less protected sex, more sexually transmitted infections, and more unplanned pregnancies. Um, and uh, this is tremendously uh, common and yet often uh, another uh, experience that um, fills people with shame. And so most women with ADHD start out hiding their difficulties. And when they find that this works, it often segues into an avoidance of overstimulation, uh, withdrawing from uh, social situations that might be uncomfortable. And uh, some women finally find that uh, the greatest security is in uh, just isolating themselves uh, from interactions that are confusing and overwhelming. And, uh, but while isolation does protect them from the pain of judgment, they also never get to be truly known. So the, these are central nervous system hypersensitivities. And while uh, men and women with ADHD um, have them, women uh, have uh, more of these particular sensitivities. Uh, more tactile uh, sensitivities, uh, which makes them uh, uncomfortable with lots of different kinds of touches. Um, sometimes people just touch them too lightly, even if they're trying to be affectionate and it's really annoying. 
um, many people try to hug someone and then they sort of stiffen up and don't understand why they're having that response. But it's really about the actual uh, sensory overload of the touch itself. Uh, and then, of course, it includes the more classic tags in the back of clothes, tight waistbands, uh, hair in their face, wool sweaters, things like that. Uh, more somatic complaints for women. Um, lots of headaches, including migraines, uh, stomach aches, nausea. Uh, and, and many women wake up in the morning with, um, you know, some of these kinds of somatic discomforts. And it's really not until their brain engages in something else that it, it really starts uh, resolving. Uh, women with ADHD are three times more likely than women without ADHD to have insomnia. And that is certainly a, a big problem. And then being tired, uh, it all feeds on itself. It's, it, it, um, if you're tired enough, it interrupts your, your concentration. It's more depressing. It makes you want to eat carbohydrates. It's, it, there's a, a lot of bad stuff about it. Um, and uh, ADHD brains respond to the, the highest level stimulation and pain um, can really distract the brain from other activities. And uh, women seem, with ADHD seem to experience pain even more intensely than men, um, and they have a higher likelihood of fibromyalgia. And so they're struggling with uh, pain uh, for um, a lot of their waking hours. Um, and other sensory problems include sounds like uh, loud music. A very common complaint is listening to people chew. Um, freaks out a lot of people. Fork scraping on plates. Sensitivity to changes in light. Not necessarily a full seasonal affective disorder, but just, you know, around uh, end of October, beginning of November, a lot of uh, a lot of women with ADHD find their moods starting to go down, and then also sensitivity to odors like uh, perfume and gasoline. Those are uh, um, problematic incense uh, in New Agey stores. Uh, also, can drive them out screaming. Okay, and um, and then there are. Um, comorbid coexisting issues that um, as the longer that you're going undiagnosed, the more you're developing um, other ways of managing your symptoms. Um, and uh, by adulthood, most women have at least one COVID comorbid disorder. Uh, and uh, it doesn't have to be a disorder. So emotional dysregulation is the most common one we talked about before. Um, and uh, anxiety and depression are the main ones that uh, most women uh, end up dealing with, uh, followed closely by eating disorders of some sort. Um, and externalizing disorders, which is uh, as found primarily in more uh, impulsive women, and that would be something like oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, uh, certainly, males uh, males have more externalizing disorders uh, than women. But if you compare women with ADHD to women without ADHD, the percentage of, of how much more likely they are to have externalizing disorders is actually a higher percentage than comparing um, ADHD men to men without ADHD. So it's a uh, it's, a, it's an important factor as well. And then there's also um, personality disorders, uh, with borderline personality being the most common, but also uh, paranoid and uh, histrionic, uh, passive aggressive, and dependent. But borderline is a, a pretty common comorbid uh, issue. And all of these things just um, complicate the symptom picture so that when you're talking to a clinician, it is, it is just not pure um, ADHD symptoms about 
uh, being distracted and having trouble, trouble with time management. So it's just a very different picture. And then we have the role of impulsivity. So impulsivity um, uh, tends to make people have more gender atypical behaviors. So um, um, behaviors that others may perceive as controlling or demanding or projecting blame or being angry um, that are just uh, less, light, less familiar uh, to be seen in women. Uh, they are also more likely to participate in high-risk behaviors like speeding, extreme sports, hypersexuality. More addictive behaviors like um, nicotine, alcohol, opioids, marijuana, compulsive shopping. And what we're finding is that um, estrogen actually interacts with these addictive behaviors making them much more uh, potent problems. And a study done about nicotine showed that for women, uh, an estrogen was in their system. They started smoking earlier. They smoked uh, more. They start, smoked more often. They had a harder time stopping. And I think as we go through all of these um, um, uh, substances, I think these studies are going to be finding that everything that um, increases uh, dopamine is also related to estrogen levels. Um, so again, the, the centrality of uh, the hormone involvement is, is just amazing. Um, and we talked about eating disorders, but uh, w impulsive women um, tend to have more bulimia uh, than other types of eating disorders. And they're more likely to um, self-harm. And this is a big deal, uh, whether self-harm is uh, picking skin, uh, picking cuticles, cutting, um, burning. Uh, it tends to peak in early childhood. Um, and, uh, and more impulsivity uh, usually predicts uh, more self-harm, which is in, um, is significantly um, more likely than in women without ADHD. And um, so ultimately, these are um, the outcomes that I was referring to. Here's why this is also important. The stress of constantly feeling less than, of expecting criticism, of feeling overwhelmed, frantic, stupid, of fearing rejection, of being unable to explain why your brain won't listen to you. These can become toxic ruminations that grow over time until they begin to block out the sunlight. And um, there are a number of ways in which um, this gets expressed. Um, women tend to not take as good care of themselves. Uh, they're not motivated to take care of themselves, even if they're responsible about caring for their children. Uh, but whether it's um, not watching what they eat and um, um, becoming overweight or developing diabetes or periodontal, periodontal problems um, or avoiding wellness checkups like mammograms, there are lots of different ways in which self-care over a poor self to care over time can be very undermining to your health and your life. We also find that um, undiagnosed women have a two and a half times greater chance of developing major depressive disorder um, than women without ADHD. And those with a childhood history of ADHD, which is usually shorthand for maybe they had some hyperactive impulsive symptoms, um, uh, in addition to depression, have the greatest risk of suicide attempts. Um, intimate partner violence, which is women uh, with a history of childhood ADHD, uh, who have a significantly increased risk of physical and psychological victimization in their relationships. Uh, the risk is increased if they've had abuse in their childhoods, uh, and those with low self-esteem may also come to believe that their symptoms may make them less lovable, 
and accept abuse as the necessary price for a relationship. And then we talked about the idea of uh, self-harm, which is um, extremely common, um, and, um, and suicidality, which is also extremely common, especially in the um, more inattentive um, uh, group. Uh, but, you know, the despair and demoralization uh, just keep growing. And if you, uh, you know, include uh, isolation so that it is, it just becomes um, a, a, an endless loop of rumina rumination. Um, and now what we're finding is that um, there's even a, a earlier mortality uh, for women with ADHD compared to men and certainly compared to women without ADHD. Uh, and impulsive women, again, um, have the highest risk of an early death, with accidents being the most common cause. Um, and, you know, substance abuse uh, would increase the risk further. Uh, and accidents are, um, I think, driving. Um, or even, and even people just uh, rushing frantically um, and uh, falling and common breaking ankles, breaking feet. Um, it's just, it's a lot of risk. Um, then you have high cholesterol, obesity, su uh, substance abuse. Um, all of these can contribute uh, to a, a death that, it, that could be earlier than others by maybe nine to 12 years. And that's really hard to get your head around. And this is really recent uh, uh, research. So I don't know how much more startling these outcomes need to be before the concerns of women with ADHD get the attention they deserve. But I hope I'm getting your attention with it. And finally, so um, what, what can you do about this? Uh, what kinds of treatment considerations uh, are important? And. You know, I hate to say that the first thing is the most important thing. Um, find a therapist who gets it, but it's also the most difficult thing. And I wish that I could say that, th that there are lots and lots of clinicians and primary care doctors and, and uh, uh, you know, other mental health uh, clinicians who know a lot about women with ADHD but there aren't that many. And it takes hard work. And if you're not in uh, a big city or near a big city, it's even harder. And yet it is really the most important thing. If someone says, no, I know about ADHD, that's really not good enough. You have to ask uh, how many women they've treated. Um, and if you feel like your concerns are minimized or, or not validated in the first session, um, please don't go back. Um, and it's important to try to find someone who will, who will get who you are and what the struggles are. Um, and then family psychoeducation, which is that it's not just good enough for you to know about this. It's really important that your uh, support network gets it. So that's everybody in your family um, and um, maybe a friend or two um, so, that, um, so that you have the support of people who understand what's going on. And um, the therapist can really help with the things that really can help you, which is uh, questioning your societal expectations and focusing on your strengths and forgiving yourself and feeling entitled to boundaries and communicating directly, practicing self-advocacy. These things cannot be learned on your own and it's good to have a guide along that journey. They can also help you uh, learn to restructure your uh, home in a more organized but ADHD user-friendly way, uh, which usually helps women a lot. Um, Medication can be very helpful if um, you choose to go that route. But again, you have to find someone who is aware of the hormonal issues 
um, and um, you know knows about really medicating women with ADHD, and um, and coaching uh, helps everybody with ADHD, and online support groups uh, because they um, you 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 can be anonymous if you want to. Or you can, um, you know, make yourself known. But in any event, it will normalize what your life is like, um, and uh, you'll have other people who really get the way you're living. And uh, I think that that is one of the the best things that can happen. The point of this webinar is that it's essential for you to be well informed, be armed with the facts, and don't allow your perspective to be dismissed. Your voice needs to be heard and your experience validated. I hope this information can help you um, by empowering you to get the help you need in the pursuit of an unapologetically authentic life. That's what I wish you all. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. That was excellent. Um, we have lots of questions, way more than we can answer, but um, I'll try to filter them for the ones that have been asked the most often. Uh, one is a lot of women want to get involved in studies on women in ADHD. Is there any, any information you can pass along to them on how to get started? Uh, well, that is certainly music to my ears because, um, you know, as, as I said, there are certainly not enough subjects uh, out there that you know, or, so we need to we need them. Um, my recommendation is to contact uh, the university settings where they're uh, studying ADHD uh, in in New York, um, uh, Mount Sinai, and uh, NYU are are two sites uh, where they're always doing studies. Uh, Mass General in Boston. Um, I'm. I'm in the New York, so those are the areas I know, or um, the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so it's about contacting one of those uh, university sites. They have studies going on. They'll be thrilled to hear from you. Okay. Um, a question, can ADHD develop in adult women, or is it most likely that it has been there since childhood and was overlooked or not recognized? That is one of the controversies that I referred to in the very beginning. Um, I think that uh, my my experience, my clinical experience, is that uh, there are women who don't really experience um, symptoms until uh, the perimenopause uh, or menopause, which also um, usually intersects with. Uh, children going off, empty nest experience, reevaluating life, uh, a lot of changes at that time. Um, and so I think that those probably those are high functioning people who were able to coast by for a lot of their lives when they had uh, uh, structure and uh, estrogen. And, uh, you know, so my answer is it probably has always been there. But there are certainly people who feel that there is an, um, an adult onset ADHD. Mm -hmm. um, you had mentioned about um, assessment scales, rating scales. Is there a particular assessment scale that you recommend to ensure uh, that, that capture a women's range of typical symptoms and impairments? Well, unfortunately, there there really isn't anything like that. I mean. Um, I guess to give ourselves, uh, uh, it's actually only a quarter of a plug because we do have uh, in in our books, um, uh, Kathleen Nadeau and Pat, Patty Quinn and I, um, uh, scales that are not normed at all. So they can't, they, they do tap into those questions, but they can't be used diagnostically. Um, there is, um, uh, Margaret Weiss has a functional impairment scale that I think comes close to capturing some of those things. Uh, but unfortunately, diagnoses are made uh, 
based on the criteria on DSM-5, and those are ones that are not very user-friendly for women. So um, we're working on that right now, um, a great new uh, assessment instrument, but not yet. Mm -hmm. um, what about um, thyroid issues in ADHD? Um, it's been asked a couple of times, um, and have the interplay between uh, hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism and uh, and ADHD symptoms. Any any thoughts about that? Any studies, research? There is incredibly minimal research. I I definitely know that um, there is a big correlation there, um, and uh, but. In the, uh, as I was saying in the beginning, what we're learning all the time, we can't always answer the why. Uh, why are those things related? Um, so, or, you know, exactly how, and even which one triggers the other one. But there is no doubt that, um, that uh, women should be getting uh, evaluated uh, by an endocrinologist. Uh, since we're talking about hormone levels of all sorts, it, it would be really helpful to um, take a look at the T3 and T4 levels as well. Several people have asked about how all these, uh, the lack of uh, sufficient treatment and the, and the ignorance about hormones um, and ADHD, how does that affect women in their careers? Um, do you have any research on that versus men? About how the, the hormonal issues? Well, the fact that it's not being sufficiently treated in a lot of cases, what does that look like in a woman who has a career? Uh, what might she start to see or experience in her career? Um, well, yeah, I mean, that, that's the problem is that, I mean, without this awareness, you're going to suddenly be experiencing, uh, you know, uh, greater concentration problems, uh, more distractibility, a lot of problems with verbal memory, which, you know, in a, a work setting is really uh, problematic, mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and more mood problems and um, emotionality, and um, you won't be able to understand why. Uh, so if you start feeling any of these things, I mean, and women often say, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm crazy that I, I imagine that. And, you know, that there's, this is really uh, a theme that gets worse and worse. So the best thing that they can do, I mean, is uh, at the first signs, um, you know, talk to an endocrinologist or even their gynecologist as a way of uh, addressing some of those needs. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of women here, and not surprising to you, have brought up the fact that they don't feel that their male clinician, doctor, whatever, is capturing or even aware of a lot of what you brought up. Um, a lot of them want to educate their, their clinicians. So do you have any wording for how women can bring up their cycle and medication interactions with their doctor? Might there be a way to broach that conversation? Um well, absolutely. I mean, that's sort of, uh, you know, the, the sort of radical intent behind this <laughs> talk is that right. um, um, you all know more about it now than many clinicians do. And um, and I've I've actually had clinicians call me and challenge me on this from from Mississippi. And I had someone from Iowa and um, um, and, you know, so th you can literally send articles uh, you can send my articles. I mean, you can sell. Mm -hmm. You can send the original research articles or you know summaries uh, that I've written up. But it is really important to not back down on this, and um, you know, and not to set you know because I, I mean I have been told that the reason that they don't follow up with um, hormone um, levels in terms of where in the cycle people are to match uh, subjects is because it's it's time consuming. Um, and that's probably not a good enough answer for uh, right. the fact that, that this is really can destroy people's lives. So uh, they have to um, insist that it's an issue. And, uh, you know, th there are 
we have just the beginning of articles that you can refer people to so that it won't get dismissed. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I would also be lying if I didn't say that, you know, I've been I've been pursuing this issue about um, females and ADHD for 30 years and um, it's slow going. Yeah. So I'm just saying that it isn't like all clinicians will just so, say, oh, I get it now, um, you know, a few more each day. But um, nonetheless, um, you know, carry your torch high and 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 do what you can. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the hour is up. That was excellent. Very insightful. Mm -hmm. And thanks so much for being here and sharing your expertise. Um, it opened my eyes quite a bit. So. I, and I'm sure the audience as well. So thanks again. Uh, you're welcome. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here, and I hope this was helpful to everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Attitude, for mm -hmm. being aware that this is a really important issue. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to thank all of the attendees for joining us. And please join us uh, on January 6th when John Mitchell will talk about how the ADHD brain can use mindfulness to manage all the stressors of COVID. Um, that ought to be a good one. Thanks everyone for being here and have a great day.